What's going on, guys? Alan here, coming at you with some product and quotient theorems of these new complex polar forms that we've been dealing with. So not too much here, but just multiplying and dividing with these new forms. And uh, of course, I'm going to derive them for you at the beginning, and then we'll do a few examples, then go practice. So we're going to start off by actually looking at what it looks like to multiply complex numbers in their rectangular form. So I just wanted to do this with you real quick before we actually see the polar or trig form of it. And so hopefully you guys remember how to distribute or FOIL. Um, obviously, if when I do the one times these things, both of them, I will just get that back. So I'll write negative two root three plus two i. That's what we get when we multiply something times one. Then when I multiply by the i root three, starts getting a little bit more tricky. So remember the outsides and insides of like roots or radicals, we can multiply. So the i times the negative two will give me a negative two i. And then the root three times the root three would give me a square root of nine, which is also three. And so I'll clean that up in just a second, but then I'm gonna to have to distribute the i root three to the two i itself. And again, outsides of like roots, and there is no other root there, so the square root of three will remain. So an i root three times two i will give me positive two i squared times the square root of three. And nothing really to do with the blue, but the red has a few things that we can simplify. And that is the square root of nine. I know that becomes a three. So a negative two i times a three gives me negative six i. And then the i squared, if you guys remember from the last video, that's the one thing I told you to memorize on what you had already learned for complex numbers, and that was i squared is equal to negative one. So that means I can actually take that and have a positive two times a negative one times root three, which gives me a negative two square root of three. So combining my like terms with this, I will end up with, well, if you notice here, I got some real numbers, negative two root threes plus another negative two root threes, which gives me negative four square root of three. And then I also have some imaginary numbers, positive two i's. When I take away six i's, I'm left with negative four i's, okay? And I'm not talking about those of you that have glasses on right now, but remember there is our real and our imaginary part to make up what is called a complex number. So not too bad, but again, kind of laborsome, a lot of things that we'd have to do as far as um, simplifying with both insides and outsides of roots, I squareds and uh, things of that nature. So what we're gonna do is actually start to look at these things in its alternative form, which is what we worked on in the previous video. And let's see if we can rewrite the one plus i root three in its other form, which would be called polar or trig form. And then same thing with negative two root three plus two i. So we're gonna take both of those individually, the one plus i root three, and we're gonna graph which we talked about where that would leave us moving right one and up the square root of three. And then from that, we could form our right triangle and find both our angle theta by using inverse tan of that square root of three over one. And then we could also find our radius of this by using the Pythagorean theorem. Or we could have noticed that this is a 30, 60, 90, because we noticed that this was a, this was a root three, and so therefore this would have had to have been two times a, which would have been two and much faster. So however you get there, hopefully you notice that we can rewrite this as our r cis theta, which would have been a 60 degree angle because we know tangent yields a square root of three for an angle of 60 degrees. So that's the first conversion that we would have had to have done. And so what they're asking us to do is take that 
and multiply it by the other, which the other one, remember, was negative 2 root 3 plus 2i. So doing a similar conversion over here, I will take that negative 2 root 3 plus 2i and see what its equivalent polar or trig form is. So again, graphing that, going negative 2 root 3 in the real and positive 2 in the imaginary would allow me to have a right triangle with angle theta and length r. And so with that, again, hopefully you can notice that this angle would have to be 30 degrees because if this were a, then this would be a root 3, and therefore this would be 2 times a for a distance of 4. So I now have my 4 for my r. Cis, the theta, careful, is not 30 degrees, but it would be 180 less the 30, which would be 150 degrees. So that would be the other version of this that I would put in over here. So I have 4 cis, 150 degrees. And so writing them in their expanded form, I would have 2 cosine of 60 degrees plus 2i sine of 60 degrees, and then times, which is this part, the 4 cis 150 expanded out would be 4 cosine of 150 plus 4 times the i sine of 150. Now you're looking at this compared to what we had originally, and you're thinking to yourself, why would we ever, one, convert it like we had to do here with all of this stuff and then have to do it a second time to get something that is much longer and more involved. Trust me, there is a reason for all this. So here we go. Let's finish. Let's foil or distribute this thing out so that we can see what the result of it all is. So that means I got to start with the two cosine 60 and distributing it to the other two. So again, outsides would be the two and the four multiplied together, which give me eight. And then I would have the cosine of 60 times the cosine of 150. And then plus, I'd have to multiply the two times the four i, which would give me eight i. And then cosine of 60 times the sine of 150. Now remember that's just the first part of that. I would also have to then distribute the 2i sine 60 to each of those things. So the 2i times the 4 would give me another 8i and then I would have the sine of 60 times the cosine of 150 and then plus a 2i times a 4i would give me an 8i squared, which I'll take care of that in a minute. And then the sine of 60 times the sine of 150. Now we got to do a bit of house cleaning, just like we did before, and try to make this look much simpler than it currently does. So first things first, I'm going to take care of the i squared, which we said would be equal to a negative 1. And so we know a positive 8 times a negative just gives me a negative 8. So I can rewrite this as minus 8 times the sine of 60. And so I'm going to take this whole thing over here, and I'm just going to write it under that one, because that would give me negative 8 times the sine of 60 times the sine of 150. And that allows me to have all of my real parts together along with the imaginary parts stacked up. But even though I stack them, it doesn't necessarily mean that I can add them. Because if you notice, these are both cosines. These are both sines. This is the cosine of 60. This is the sine of 60. Sine, cosine, different. But we hopefully will see that there is something that they have in common, an 8 of this and that. And that will then give me cosine of 60 
times the cosine of 150 minus the sine of 60 times the sine of 150. And then I'm going to do the same thing with these two, but I'm going to factor out an 8 and an i. So positive 8i. If I factor that of each, I get cosine of 60, sine of 150, plus the sine of 60 times the cosine of 150. And at this point, I want you to stop and think. Hopefully those look familiar. Does all of that and does all of that start to resemble something? And hopefully you notice because of what we studied a couple of chapters ago, those are our sum and difference formulas for sine and cosine. All right? So just to refresh your memory, the cosine of A plus B was equal to cosine of A, cosine of B, minus, because remember cosine was X over R, and remember X's are X's of R's because they wanted the opposite of us. And then it was the sine of A times the sine of B. And hopefully you notice that is exactly what we have right here. Which means I can rewrite this whole thing as 8 times the cosine of A plus B. And so 60 and 150 together gives me 210 degrees. Plus, then I will take and refresh your memory about what this one would be. And when we have both sines and cosines involved, hopefully you remember that was the sine of A plus B. That was equal to the sine of A cosine of B. And remember, sine was Y over R, and Ys are Ys. We listen to them. We do what they say. And then it was the sine of B times the cosine of A. The angle's in reverse. And that's exactly what we have here. Which means, don't forget it's being multiplied, positive 8i. I can rewrite that as the sine of 60 plus 150, which again is 210 degrees. Which is actually quite nice because if you notice, I can rewrite that in its condensed form, which would be my R cis theta. which that is pretty nice and simple. However, let's go back to what we started with. Remember up here, we actually started with this. And after a bunch of arm waving, we were able to take these two, which were in polar form, which they weren't originally. We had to do a bit of work for that here and there. But when we multiplied those things, look what we ended up doing after all of this arm waving and using a couple of identities, we're able to take this form right here and work it to this. And if you look from there to there, let me write it for you one more time so that you can see it a little bit more clear. If I take two cis of 60 degrees and multiply it times four cis 150, what do we already know how to multiply? Well, hopefully you said like terms. So that means since these are multiplying and all of this virtually is multiplying, I can take the two times the four and get eight. They each have the cis in common, but notice this is where it gets a little different, which is why I went through all of this with you, is to show you why it is what it is. We don't take the 60 times the 150 and multiply the angles what we ended up doing was actually adding the angles to get 60 plus 150, which is 210 degrees, which is what we got by doing 
all of this arm waving. But now we can simply jump from here to there a whole lot quicker. And I mean a whole lot quicker. That was much faster than what we did originally with having to distribute these forms and then cleaning it all up and dealing with I squareds and like roots and then combining like terms to get this. So that's the cool part about, and this is called the derivation or proof of why when we are multiplying complex polar numbers, we just get to multiply the radii of each to get two times four, which is eight. And then we take the cosine plus I sine of the two angles, and instead of multiplying them, we actually add them to get 210 degrees. So I wanted to show you the derivation, the proof of why it was what it was. But now, very quickly, I also want to show you that we will get the exact same thing we got originally when we started this whole thing. So if I rewrite 8 cis 210, that would be 8 cosine of 210 plus 8 times the I sine of 210. And so obviously the only thing that we're going to have to do is evaluate those trig functions again. So I'll have my 8 over 1, and I'll be multiplying that times the cosine of 210, which if I'm at 210 degrees, I know I'm 180 plus 30 degrees more. And all students take, meaning that they will both be negative something. And hopefully you know the sine and cosine of 30 would be a root 3 over 2 for cosine and a 1 half for sine, leaving us with a final answer by canceling of negative 4 root 3 minus 4i, which is exactly what we got up here. So obviously, we're not going to go through all the trouble of converting each of these complex numbers into their alternative form in polar or trig form. And then getting both of those things just to multiply them to get this and then having to expand and evaluate, that's too much work. If we only had two numbers that were multiplied together in their complex form, we would just FOIL, distribute, and combine our like terms to get our final answer carefully because all this other stuff was too much work. Now again, we're not gonna have to do this ever again. That's just to show you that whenever we have these things, we can multiply the Rs and then add the angles to multiply any two complex polar form. But you can see we end up with the same result regardless. So whatever you choose, choose the quickest, easiest method, but Sometimes we're going to have to be able to rewrite it, and you guys will see why as we progress through this section. All right. So, just to kind of recap, there is both the product and the quotient theorem, which I'm not going to go through and spend time proving that one as well, but you can probably guess what would happen. The product, we said, when we have two R values, we will do exactly what it says and multiply them. But when we have that cis of our angles, we said when we're multiplying, we would actually add the angles, which again, it's much easier to put that than the whole cosine plus I sine like they have right here. Okay, it's much easier to just write the cis much quicker. So what do you think happens when we divide? Well, you could probably guess we will take the R's and do what it says and divide. But what about the angles, which I prefer the cis form because it's just a lot easier. What are we going to do with those angles? Well, when we multiplied, we added the angles. And when we divide, yep, we're going to subtract. Okay. So whether you write it all out or you write the cis, you need to know that these are one and the same. And I love my cis, so I will keep writing it that way. All right. So that's what we're dealing with in this section. 
to start. So let's take a look at how these things kind of play out. And if they write it initially like this and you would rather use your sys, go ahead. It's just a little bit easier to write down. So I'll start by taking the four sys 120, which is what that first form is that they gave me. And they asked us to find the product of that and the other, which is five sys 30. Now notice they asked us to put it in rectangular form. Right now it is currently in polar form or trig form because we have the R and the theta or the sine and cosines. But when I write it like this, I know that I can multiply the R's together to get 20 sys. Then I take and careful, don't multiply the angles as well. Even though you'll get 360 or 3600, you'll have something that you can deal with. But remember, we don't want to do that. We want to add. And I showed you why in the proof right before this. So adding 120 and 30, I get 150 degree angle. Now, unfortunately, that is still in their trig or polar form. They wanted it in rectangular form. So all we have to do is expand and simplify. So 20 cosine of 150 plus 20 I sine of 150. That then asks us to evaluate it. And so we will take these two trig values and evaluate. So I'll put the 20 over one and the 20 I over one and figure out what my reference angle is and what quadrant I'm in would be quadrant two for the 150 degrees. And that would be 30 less than 180 degrees, which means we're dealing with the reference angle of 30 degrees. So the cosine of 30 degrees, hopefully we know, is root three over two. And the sine of 30 degrees is one half. And that's where most people will make their mistake. Just be careful. Don't forget, we were in quadrant two, which means the only one that would be positive would be sine. This right here would be negative. So be careful with that. Don't lose your sight of your signs and make a silly mistake like that. And then just remember to simplify. And the only time that we can simplify is when we're multiplying. So the two goes in the 20 10 times, which leaves me with negative 10 root three. Two and 20 10 times. Don't lose your eye either. I know it's hard to see when you don't have your eye, but all right, some of you guys got that joke. That would be our final form, which they asked us to find it in, which is rectangular. Very, very simple when multiplying, much easier than if they were to give it to us in that rectangular form of a complex number opposed to the polar form that they originally gave it to us in. So a lot of these you will see ask us to put it in rectangular form, which just gives us an extra step. Now be careful, we do have negatives going on. And so how is this different? Well, remember they're asking us to divide. So we're gonna divide what we can. We know 27 divided by nine is three. The cis will stay, but remember we take the top and subtract the bottom. So in this case, that's going to give us a 45 degree angle minus a negative 180 degree angle. And remember when you subtract a negative in your life, that is my friends, a positive thing. In other words, if we were to take away the 45 in front there and we just had this, you would wanna multiply those two negatives, which gives us a positive 180. So however you look at it, we're gonna to have to take 45 and add it to 180, which we have done many times before because those are both reference or quadrantal angles. So 180 plus 45 is 225 degrees. So that's the big difference on that. Not much to it. All we gotta do is rewrite it. And once we have it at that point, then we can evaluate the cosine and sine of 225. Just don't forget what quadrant you would be in and what things would be positive and what would be negative. So I'm gonna write this so that I don't make the mistake. I always like to take care of it first, All right? And 
when I'm looking at that, I know for a fact that I'm already going to be in quadrant three. 180 we took. And remember, we added 45 more. So we're going to be here, which means we're going to both be negative. And with the reference angle 45, that means for sine and cosine, they are the same. And hopefully you remember them as root two over two. So multiplying those across to get a final answer, I would have a negative three root two over two, and then also another negative three I root two over two. Now they may want the I there or they may take the I and put it on the outside. Either way is fine. Just make sure that you have it in either or, okay? So that's it. Uh, the cis is a much simpler form. So if you wanna to continue to write it like that, whether they do or not, I definitely think that you should because it's just easier to see the parts that are actually gonna be changing and then expand it out and evaluate to simplify. Because remember they did ask us to put it in rectangular form.